Hi, my name is Danielle. Um, I'm a teacher at Hobsonville Point Secondary School. If you haven't heard about us yet, um, it's a bit of a surprise. We're very much oversharers. We like to share everything we do. Um, but I'm also involved with Twitter quite heavily. Um, and there's a community that I run online there, professional development for teachers, free all the time. So all this happy, buzzy feelings you get from you learn that it doesn't go away, that you can keep getting more of that the whole year long. Um, and then my co-presenter, Jane Gilbert, over here. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, I'm Jane Gilbert. Um, I'm Professor of Education at AUT University. Um, and um, I, but you, uh, I don't know if you've come across things I've done, but um, I used to be at NZCER. I used to be Chief Researcher at NZCER. But I've been at AUT for two years now. And just since that's there, um, at AUT, we've set up this um, little group of people who are interested in the future of education called EdgeWorks, and that's the hashtag and the uh, little logo for it there that you might want to um, have a look at. So, we start. <laughs> um, just when you have a look at the title of this, um, you'll, I hope you don't think this is a, a workshop about modern learning environments, because it's not really. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a critical look at, at and, 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 and an attempt to put it in a bigger picture. So that's, that's my role in this um, workshop, is to provide some of the wider context and to raise some difficult questions and for you to think about. And the other thing that I should say is that this is not going to have very much at all to do with um, what you can do with kids tomorrow. It's about you and your thinking and um, what, why I'm doing that should become obvious by the end of it, I hope. So um, just to make sure no one's um, here for the wrong reasons. So, um, so, uh, I've been working on this whole um, question and issues to do with the future of education and what, it, what, it, what are some of the issues that we need to think about for quite a while now. It's about 15 years, I think. And about 10 years ago, I wrote a book called Catching the Knowledge Wave um, that um, I, yeah, there's a lot of things that have happened since then, but nothing much has really changed. So a lot of these, a lot of these things are coming from that. Now, there's a story that's told that, that'll be really familiar to all of you about the future of education, because these words are everywhere now. Um, but what I want to do is to go a bit deeper below them. Now, the, st the way the story is usually told, it goes something like this, that there are these mega trends, these really big things that are happening in the world outside education, so social, political, and economic changes, and they're happening faster and faster and faster, and that they need to influence what happens in the education system, but they haven't yet. Um, so some of these megatrends are the ones that you will have heard of many times, the so-called digital revolution, the incredible increase, exponential increase in the power and capacity of um, digital devices to, to, and, and, and the implications that that's got for the economy and jobs and the political and, ec and economic situation and so on. So that's one of them, and I'm not, I'm not going to say very much about it except that because you'll all know what that is. Um, the second thing is major... Um, demographic and economic changes that are happening all around the world and there's a major shift in um, world, world order that's going on at the moment. The, the, the previously dominant countries, are low, well, people are saying that the, their dominance is slowing and uh, there are other groups of countries emerging that are, that are having much more of an economic impact. And the ones that people always talk about are the so-called BRICS group of countries, Brazil, Russia, um, India, China and South Africa. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on in the world beyond education that's going to change things quite dramatically in our lifetimes, let alone the lifetime of the kids that we, we teach. The, other, the third thing that's usually mentioned is this thing called wicked problems that, um, to some extent, um, I sort of re regret using this expression in um, educational context because I hear so often people say, how can, how can we solve the wicked problems? And if you say we're going to solve the wicked problems, you've kind of missed the point a bit because wicked problems aren't solvable using the conventional ways of thinking that we have now. They need new ways of thinking between the existing disciplines to, in order to... But climate change and things like that are the obvious examples. We need new kinds of thinking to work on those things. The fourth thing... Uh, and this is the one that I've spent most time thinking about, is the huge changes in not only the amount of knowledge, but also the speed at which it's replaced and, the, and where it's created and where it exists. And so 
people are now saying that knowledge is now networked. You just, it's just impossible to find it in the in the minds of individuals or databases or, or, or libraries or spaces or anything like that in the ways we're used to thinking about it. It changes in, in, by the nanosecond and its meaning has changed. So people are now saying that knowledge is too big to know. One person or one, you know, as soon as we know something, it's, it's changed. So um, if you're interested in that, there's a really good book that I really recommend with that title, too big to know by a guy called David Weinberger, and if you if you re really read that book, it sh it should blow your mind because it's it under it um, undermines and challenges virtually all the assumptions that we were all brought up with and that our school curriculum is based on. So that's so that's the first part of the story. This is a two part story: is that there are these big trends in the world beyond education, and education is supposed to respond to them. Oh, wrong way. Um, now. In the education sector, particularly the policy environment, for each of those stories that I was, that these, these trends that I was just talking about, each of them is huge. It would take you a full-time job just to keep up with the, the literature that's happening on, in those areas, um, you know, just to keep up with them. So, so it's a huge area. I've just glossed over it in, in a couple of minutes. But the education policy and research literature on this has kind of summarised all that and the documents that there are about this kind of thing have tend to reduce it to these two things. It's all been converted down and you know digested down into first thing we have to do is we need better system performance. And peop those of if you're teachers, you'll know all about this because the Ministry of Education has certain targets that we have to meet, and we need to raise the standard of um, more people achieving more, knowing more by certain dates, and so on. So that's the overall performance of the system doing better. That's the first thing it's been reduced to. And the second thing is the, the use of technology. You'll, and, and we see that all around us all the time. Now these technologies that we were supposed to, that, that were supposed to disrupt things, that were supposed to change things dramatically, haven't had that effect. They've basically just been added into the existing structures. But that's another long story that I'm not going to go into now. But um, there, there's, a, there's a lot in that. But the, the point I'm making here is that all of that huge body of work that I had on the slide before, has basically been digested down and in policy literature comes out like this. We need better system performance and we need to use more technology in education. So we end up getting things like this. This is all I could fit on the slide. But we get all these kind of buzzwords, all these sort of slogans, these um, words that everybody sees everywhere all the time, of which modern learning environments is one of them. And they're... They're kind of out there supposedly disrupting things, but I want to argue, and I'll do this a bit more later, that they're not actually having a disruptive effect. They're just adding yet more stuff to, um, to m make the existing system more efficient and, and so on, but it hasn't really deeply disrupted. Now, I'm just going to finish this section with this quote. This guy, Carl Bereiter, is um, 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 a well-known educational psychologist. He's, he's, he's Canadian, and he's quite old now. He's worked in this field for a long, 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 long time. Now, this quote is in, about something different, but I think it applies here. He says, when he's talking about the future of education and the knowledge age and so on, that the trouble is that for any of this thinking, and the, of which there's lots, to make its way into practice, it has to be passed through a conceptual machine that turns it into a product, a procedure, or a slogan. So all of those things I had on the first slide, it's a huge body of work but it gets reduced down to a few slogans and a few buzzwords that people then think that means they're doing future-focused education. But they're not. They just add a few buzzwords to the existing things that they already do. So Baraita goes on to say, like the flour mill that removes the bran and the wheat germ from the wheat, whole wheat grain, leaving only the starch and the white bread, this conceptual machine removes all thought. Now that's really my, the key thing, the point that I want to make out of this presentation, is that unless the elements in the system, i.e. you guys, are thinking about these things deeply and processing them rather than just um, f following models that come from elsewhere, then it, it, the whole thing will die. So I've continued this metaphor saying that it removes all thought, leaving only empty calories that will eventually kill us. <laughs> Um, because I'm kind of um, interested in this sort of thing, and that's supposed to represent some of those there. Um, so uh, can this conceptual machine be resisted, and should it is kind of really the, what I want to t talk about in the, in the next section of this, um, and I obviously think it should. So, oh. 
Then you'll. Okay. Yep. All right. So hopefully you've checked your email and you've gotten those links I've sent you. If you haven't, you can access that um, first part of the resource there. So um, we thought we'd touch, focus these ideas because it's a little bit, these are huge ideas to wrap your head around. And it's easier to wrap your head around them if there's something to actually look at and talk about and really consider. So we thought we'd wrap it around this idea of modern learning environment. So the first part that um, we're going to look at, so it's in your email, the part one resource, and um, also at that link, so you can access it either way. There's some pictures of potentially what may be or may not be some modern learning environments. So what I'm going to get you to do in your groups, so you're nicely located in little groups of about three, um, is talk to each other, decide whether the picture is a modern learning environment or not, and why. So just to give you an example, there's a photo. Is that a modern learning environment or not? And why? All right? Go through the pictures you've been sent. You've been given about, let's say, about four to five minutes to discuss with each other. Each of those pictures, are they modern learning environments? Let's go. All of them. And we'll go through them. And then we'll... found some pictures yet? Alright, you guys found some pictures yet? Can I help you find some? Oh, oh there's a whole lot of them. There's a whole lot of Don't just get stuck on the first one. So what do you reckon? Modern learning environment or not that one? That one you're looking both looking at. Why is that? Because if he's just putting in a worksheet, then it's the same as years ago, we're just using the computer to do it. But he might not be doing that, he might be doing that. So what he's doing is he designed an ice cream for an ice cream franchise and is now working out the food costs which he was going to present to the head franchisor of the company the following week. So what was the key thing that happened there? Why is it that that defines it and not what? The fact that there's a big flash Mac computer. That, that's the thing to think about. But we get all hyped up about modern learning environments. But what about those things is it? What is it about student agency that makes it what sits behind it's student agency? But why? So, but why do we want that? So, but those outcomes, if it's their passion, you can't guarantee what direction it's going to go in. What if, what if it doesn't match the achievement but objective? Are what about achievement objectives? I'm being devil's advocate, by the way. I'm not really. Well, actually, I really am this annoying, but you know. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a little chat about those together. I'm just going to grab the microphone. Um, so this session is being recorded um, and it's going to go on ETV so you can share it with whoever you'd like to share it with. But part of that means that we have to actually 
get you to talk into a microphone as well. So shall we start with that first picture? Go back a little bit, that's all right. And we'll start with that first, very first picture that I put up. And I'll just get somebody to comment on whether you thought that was a modern learning environment or not. Have I got any volunteers or do I have to pick on someone? Because I will. <laughs> Guess I, thank you very much. That one, what do you reckon? Modern learning environment or not? Uh, I hesitate to say anything about this until I see some action inside this environment. I have no idea what the students are going to do. It's just an environment. So in terms of architecture, is it a modern learning environment? Certainly it looks new and inviting. I can see different types of ways for students to gather together. Um, it certainly looks like it might have been set up with a, learning, a modern learning environment in mind, yes. Okay. I love this picture, by the way. It took me a while to find it. Is this a modern learning environment? Volunteers? I'm picking on you, sir, because you're handy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, well, it's obviously an old environment. It's, a, it's an old sepia photo. Um, it's old. They certainly look unhappy. They look, um, look like they've been... Um, so I just want to chip in here. Does that mean in modern learning environments, kids are happy? No, 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 I'm, no, I'm just making a, a point that they certainly, there's no, seems to be no sort of um, spontaneity. And they're all sitting, almost sitting exactly the same way with their hands on the front top of the desk too. But it's, it's an old, traditional environment. I also want to point out with this photo, look at the rows, look at everyone looking kind of the same, doing the same thing at the same time. What about this one? <coughs> Who's got... All right, can you justify that, please? Um, we were having a look at the different activities that they were doing, so it looks like um, the front group here is doing Jenga and the back groups look like they're doing something completely different, so there's an element of choice in the activities that they're doing. There's collaboration, um, group work. Alison? Anything else? Anything else? Um, this is my classroom, a couple of years ago now, um, and it was actually a very traditional square classroom, which when I walked in the first day, there were these nice little rows all set up, um, and all boxy, can't really see out because it's a science lab, for some reason they always box science labs in, I don't know why. Um, so physically, it's not a modern learning environment at all. In fact, all the other teachers who shared the room with me hated it because furniture would never look the same. <laughs> Um, but technically, that's not. What about this one? We thought it was. Uh, so it's got components of modern learning in that the students are not at their desk, they're so sitting together collaborating, and also there's a student who's leading the learning. Uh, the teacher's taking the, the role of, I suppose, farming, and has to get back to what um, was said at the first keynote. So the, the student's got voice. That's the main thing we pulled out of that. Thank you. Does anybody disagree with that? Well, we felt she might also um, being punished for not hand handwriting correctly, so she has to, um, you know, do that in front of the class. <laughs> Thank you. Um, over here, there was someone as well. Same, same thing. Yeah, Thank you. Look <laughs> <laughs> what about this? Is that a modern learning environment? I was saying it's, well this picture is sort of makes a point that it's not really about the environment, or the environment could be anything, it's just the modern learning practice that's taking place within it. So uh, having the outside as part of your environment, uh, the students are collaborating, uh, they're not necessarily using technology, but it, the environment might not require that. So. It's definitely uh, some form of modern learning practice, I'd argue. Interestingly enough, they had their devices there. They chose not to use them. Not because I didn't said so. Usually the first thing they do is pull them out, but they chose not to use them. They chose to draw the bits of the bridges that we're looking at. What about this one? There's a big, flash, pretty Mac computer there and everything. 
Um, so I, I was pretty happy to call this one the my only true modern learning environment for um, I extrapolated that this person was um, connected to 20,000 other learners um, down a cable and um, that he, this person wasn't just working in isolation in front of a computer uh, and that they were interacting and potentially leading learning for those other 20,000 people um, but that was an extrapolation so it might not be. Right, anybody want to counter that? Yeah. <laughs> having, be, having been a computer teacher for a while, they could be just doing very traditional work, that being given a, a work. So it's hard to tell mm. from that picture what they are, how they're connected, if they're connected, or whether it's just a task-based thing to type up in the computer. That, that starts to bring Thank up you. the question, how can we know? Doesn't it? Absolutely, how do we know? Um, for the record, what the student is doing is he's working out food costs for a product that he's designed for, you know the ice cream brand Wendy Super Sundays? Yep, so they've been designing products for them and he's working out the food costs which he has to present to the CEO of the company the following week. That's what he was doing. And he was the group leader and he's doing this task even though he doesn't actually like maths very much, but the rest of his group was being very difficult so he delegated some other tasks to them and he's been sitting with the food costs, which if you've done them before, that's a nasty task. Um, two more, how about this one? It's kind of furniture, kind of not. Is that modern learning? But why? Why did you think so? Um, we thought it was because they're sitting down and collaborating. They've, we think we've made an assumption that there's different kids who have um, put some of the stickies on and then they've done some connections and through that group talk about what those each mean. They've chosen to sit on the floor, so that's an active choice that they've made. Anybody want to disagree? Just behind you. Oh, sorry. Um, I kind of disagree because I think I grew up learning in this way. I mean, the environment, yep, looks modern, but this is an unusual practice, I don't think, in New Zealand in the last 20 years, 30, 40, 30 years. Yeah. Your face looks like it wants to say something. <laughs> <laughs> it's got that look. It could be, too, that only one is working and the others are passive around it and enjoying taking time out from something else or whatever. It's hard to tell. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Very observant. <laughs> what they were doing is this was a maths lesson where they, um, each group um, had decided to investigate different things um, that is different effects of overpopulation and then they had to propose a possible solution and find some statistics to then back up their claim. So one of the groups came up with this really cool thing about making recommendations of different planets that we should prioritise to go to first based on the resources they have and the resources we're most likely to run out of first. It was year nine. All right, cool. One last one. Any ideas? We've all gone quiet. Let's ask someone in the back. Oh, I'm going to ask this lady because she's looking at me and not looking away. So I'm hoping she's got something to say. Um, we decided that it's the context that decides whether it's a modern learning environment and you can't really tell effectively from a photo. Thank you. And on that note, I'll pass back over to Jane. Oh, you're right. So... I think we're all in agreement by now what a modern learning environment is really about to some extent. For now, that it's the context matters, it's what's going on in that space that matters, is the building doesn't, I mean, building is great, I work in one of these and it's lovely because it's all open and, you know, um, it does mean that all the other teachers have to put up with my chaos too though. Um, some of the other things, though, from the more official, I say official in that, um, Ministry of Education, 
is things around the space being flexible. So you saw that us using the space as you need. So if you think about it when you're at home, if you're going to make dinner, you're not going to do it in the lounge. Um, you use the space as you need it. You don't do everything at the same space and don't move about. You use the space for whatever you need. If you're going to read a book, you're going to go sit somewhere nice and quiet and comfortable. If you want to do homework, you're not going to sit in the family room with millions of things going on and the TV's blaring and these ones are playing a board game. You're going to go find your quiet, isolated space. So it's that flexibility and the space adapting to what we need. Um, it's their interaction with each other. So there might be some students who need to work by themselves. There might be, often there's a workshop running over here. There's some kids working by themselves over here. But it's those interactions with the people in the space as well. So we saw different groups working together and other groups not working together. We saw people drawing on the resources that they needed. Um, sometimes the resource was the environment. Sometimes it was the post-its. But whatever the resources are in the space, they're ready and there for us to use, which is often where their maker spaces come in as well that we can make what we need. It's in that space, we don't have to leave the space necessarily always, although it's nice to and really useful to. Um, there's also, you might have seen that lately, there's quite a shift from talking about MLEs to the ILE thing, the innovative learning environment. So from the ministry's point of view, they're talking about these being, this being a more internationally recognized term. And that it is again about that evolving, adapting, that that space, we change the space to what we need. And it's the same thing for when you work at home, that we change the space to suit our needs. It's flexible, it's adaptive. So. Oh, just leave it on the one for a second. <coughs> um, so, <coughs> what the, pu the purpose of all of that was to um, hopefully start to explore the idea that we are surrounded by a discourse, by a whole lot of ideas about um, what sorts of things we should be doing in education. All those words that were up there before and that all of you said, collaboration, flexibility, all of these kinds of things, they're all around us all the time and we all immersed in them like fish swimming in them. Um, but what are we doing all that for is my question. Because I don't think, and um, probably some of you won't agree with me, but th this is the, the challenge I want to kind of lob into the mix. I don't think that this discourse that we're surrounded with, with um, is disrupting things, that is challenging things. And so I, what I want to do next is to raise some questions about the, 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 f the future of education and then the point is to think about, okay, to what extent is all this discourse that we were surrounded with that we work so hard to achieve all these things um, to what extent is this actually future focused? Because it's quite common for people to think um, that if, if you've got all those things we've just been talking about, you're future focused. That's what it is, right? So that, this is the, the next, the question now is modeling and environments, digital, digital technologies, all these things that I had on that slide earlier, what's that got to do with the education's future, if anything? Or is it just a fad, I think it was in the title, wasn't it? Um, a cool thing that looks really good, but isn't actually really to do with the future of education. Education of all things should be about the future because it's preparing the young people for a future. And if we think that things are changing fast, and all those things I had up on the first slide, there's major things going on in the world beyond education, that's what we should be knowing about, thinking about, taking account of, and thinking about how can, how can things be different, not just adding a few fancy um, you know, architecture and, and, and digital devices into things, cool as they are. I mean, I'm not saying they're not, but it's, it's not, it's, people treat that, that as, as though it is the point. So what's the connection? What could it be is the basis of this next section of the talk, which probably be about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll do another activity, okay? So what I'm going to do now, I've, I've um, on the conference thing, I said I was an education theorist. I'm lots of things, but I, 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 I said I was that because that's what I'm going to do now, is to take a sidestep into some theoretical stuff, which... Um, is really just to give you a taste of some of the ideas that uh, I think we need to be thinking about if we really are serious about thinking about the future of education. Okay, so, so the... So, can I, so you say on the <coughs> one that all those <coughs> are not disrupting? 
I think they're not, no. I think we're just adding it to the existing industrial age production line. Everybody goes through in the same order, has to do the same things by the same time well, and stand I, I, would say, I would say all the new terminology and slogans are mm. anti-disruptive. Mm. Because, you know, you know, even going from the MLS and MLP to IPS, mm. you know, it's all time disruptive. And people mm. think that they're doing certain things and I think some of the slogans and things are disruptive. Mm. I think the yeah. Yeah, but I, I think they um, that they are producing change, um, gradual change, and, and probably improvement. But disruptive is a much more powerful word in the sense of a paradigm shift in terms of thinking of it's radically different. And what I'm arguing is it has to be. Well, I think in my opinion is it has to be radically different. Not just more of the same, but better, faster, better. Well, I, would, I would contend some of the terminology I mean, hasn't been well thought out. Mm, it hasn't. So mm. it has been very disruptive mm. to schools and things that want to progress in, and, I'm, and still want to change. I'm not saying it's disruptive and change. It's definitely disruptive to this day to day stuff where people are trying to, um, you know, I don't think this group is being adverse to change, but mm. I think Mm. So but one of the one of the issues that the um, the literature I'm going to talk about in a second um, says is that um, constant and accelerating, even um, faster pace of change, is a fact of life. Now it's not going to go away. So the the, the, the argument goes that the, the children need to be ready for that, need to be prepared for that, not filled up with the things as they are now, but ready for anything. Um, and so basically it means that teachers need to be like that too. So in the sense of disruptive, um, it, it, that's just how it's going to be now. I'm I think. not arguing against mm. change hmm. at all. I'm just arguing against how some of the things that... Yeah, but, but I mean, okay, so <coughs> that's, what, that's the idea I hope to get to by the end of this, is that um, if we're in the industrial age model, um, we t tend to think of things in terms of bureaucracies, in terms of um, because that's the most efficient way to organise things in that context. So there's a top-down model, there's a hierarchy, there's people above us that tell us what we should do and when we should do it, and so on. Um, part of the the work that I'm going to talk about in a minute is calling that into question and saying the days of the bureaucracy are long gone, and we we should be um, working as as a group from the bottom up to change things. That's what I'm going to get to by the end of it. Because if if we don't if we if we're being required to change within a bureaucracy, we're assuming that someone somewhere knows what it's the, what the answer is going to be. Um, we're wrong, I think, because no one knows. So the, it has to happen from the bottom up. The the the, the, the change, and that's kind of what the ideas I'm going to talk about now. Uh, so, um, so um, where was I? Um, so, futures theory is a well-established, long, um, you know, well-known kind of body of work. It's been going for at least 50 years. It's not a new thing. And there are lots and lots of people who work on this full-time, you know, it's their job. It's, their, it's what they do. And so what I've put up here is uh, one slide summarising the ideas of one guy called Jim Data, who's been doing this all his life and he's about well into his 70s, um, where he's tried to summarise what the theories of the last 50 years or so, put them into four categories, have uh, say about the future. So this is a really, you know, a, um, a summary of a summary of a summary of a summary kind of thing. Um, so he says that people who talk about this can be organised into four groups. One group says that we're going to have continued growth, that we're going to go on more or less as we are now and, and have over the last few hundred years or so. Um, things will change a bit, and they'll probably change a bit faster than they have in the past, but the same basic processes and the same basic ideas and the same basic forms of social organisation will probably stay the same much as they are today. So that's one theory that people have. And th so Jim Data says that... Um, most, most of our systems assume this, and the education system's one of them. We assume that things will go on more or less as they are now, but might be a bit faster or a bit something, but it will be the same basic forms of you know, ideas and social processes and so on. So he says that's only one model, though. 
Another model that the futures theorists talk about is that things will just collapse because we'll use up all the resources or there'll be a war or some major apocalypse, you know, dystopia type of thing will happen. And so the second the picture over there is everything will die. Right? So that's the second model that he says. The third one um, is the idea that we will recognise that continued growth isn't possible can, you know, going on the same as we are now. It's, we're already using up the world's resources and so on. And the answer will be that we'll have a highly disciplined society in which everybody will be rationed certain things and there'll be strong rules about what we can and can't do to conserve what there is at left. That's the third option, he says, that people argue for. And the fourth one, this picture down the bottom here, is what he, he calls transformation, which is we can expect massive technological environmental changes, which he data says are now well underway. They're, they're already in train, that they're inevitable now, he says, um, that will fundamentally alter the way we live, but it's impossible to imagine what that will be like. So the first three you sort of can imagine, even though we haven't necessarily experienced the number two and three, but the third one is we can't imagine what that'll be like. Now, if you start thinking about that in relation to what the education system's preparing people for, we are preparing them for the first one. And, but it could, according to the futures theorists, it could be any of the others. So data talks about this. He says, continued growth is a dominant view. Most educational thinking assumes that. And he says it actively stops us thinking about the other three possibilities. Okay, so that's what he says. He says the future isn't predictable. So anyone who tells you that we know what the future holds and we can prepare people for it is wrong. We can't. Obviously, by definition, we don't know what the future is. And so we can't construct an educational curriculum that is able to prepare people for the future. But we can construct one that could prepare people for multiple possible different futures. Now that starts to call into question the industrial age model of education where we did think we knew what the kids needed to know if they were going to be successful in the world. And we've got so many stories that we tell them, if you do this, this will happen, you'll be able to do this and you'll be able to do that and you'll be able to have a nice middle class job and buy a house and get a mortgage and have a family and live happily ever after. But that is already not true. But that's another story, I won't go into that now. Um, but data says that... Um, the purpose of education should be to prepare people for a range of alternative, possible, different futures, plural. Right? That's really important. And so if you think about that, that's got quite dramatic implications for how we think about what we teach and why we teach it and what's in the curriculum and how we do it and all of that kind of thing. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. He, he says... Um, one of the important things it should do, and the, probably the most important thing it should do, is should it, it should allow people to um, have the skills to work together to envisage and create the possible futures. Rather than just sit there waiting for it to happen to us passively um, and react to it, we should, he says, be teaching um, students to work together to collaborate to actively create the futures that we want, not just sit there waiting for it to happen to us. So that's what data says. Now, what does that mean for um, education? I'll come to in a minute. But uh, just another idea I want to throw in here. There's, uh, this, is, this book by Sardar is a very short, very quick book, a summary of, um, of uh, futures thinking. It's called the F Welcome to the Future. He's, he's, and he's written, he talks about this thing, what he calls the post-normal. Right? So everything that we have grown up with and we think is just how things are and just how it is, he says, is being called into question. The qu he, he says we're in a transitional age where the old orthodoxies are dying, new ones haven't quite emerged yet and nothing seems to make sense anymore. And his key point is that uncertainty, complexity and rapid change are here to stay. It's not just a period we're in, it's, it's, it's how things are and they're going to be in the future. And Basically, we need to adapt to that and so on. So can you see that's, I think that's got quite dramatic implications for what we do in this massive thing called the public education system. So Sardar talks about the, what he calls the three Cs. Complexity, chaos and contradictions are the, the, the features of the world of the future. So what does this mean for education? Well, just very quickly, um, the, the, the traditional uh, goal of, of education in theory going back to the ancient Greeks, which is what our system's based on, was individual intellectual cognitive development, expanding people's minds, right? Now, I think that's a good goal, but 
What I want to argue is that probably in this age that we're going into, we have to think of it as um, collective intellectual development. So instead of us all as individuals on our own developing our minds and expanding them, we have to find ways to do that together. And as I'll come to in a minute, one of the words that was up on that slide a while back uh, with all the you know, buzzwords was collaboration. And we hear that all the time now, don't we? You mentioned it several times when you were talking about modern learning environments. The collaboration thing is, is really hard. It's an easy word to say, but it's really, really hard to really do. But that's an important part of this idea of developing our collective intelligence, our minds together, not just individual things like um, marbles in a jar, just rolling around together, bumping into each other, but um, what happens between them. So I think it's important to prepare people for a range of alternative possible futures so they can survive and thrive in an increasingly complex, uncertain, fast-changing world, as I said before, and to work together to create the futures that the young people that are in school now want, that they've worked out that they, that they want. So in um, fields outside education, um, and there's a huge range of them now, there's a whole lot of theoretical frameworks that people have for thinking about how can you do this. And one of them that's, that's, that's um, predominant now, and it's not really a theory yet because it um, hasn't got the features of a, a theory, but people call it complexity thinking. So there's this, this body of work that people are using in a whole lot of different fields. It started off in biology and ecology and computer science and mathematics and the, the scientific fields, but now it's very, very common in the social sciences and business and leadership and all sorts of different fields. There's this set of ideas that people call, you know, it's a kind of like a syndrome, it's a set of ideas together they call complexity thinking. And what I'm going to do in the next five minutes or so is just quickly go through what some of those ideas are because I think it's quite helpful for thinking through, um, to, to start to think through what we might actually do in schools to build the conditions that we need for what I've just been talking about. Um, so, it's, it's quite, um, so, the, the world that the education systems are based on is, is, is part of the modern world. And so that's why I think modern learning environments is a little bit of a misnomer because, um, because we're out of the modern age now. We've, um, we, it's finished, gone. We're in the postmodern or hypermodern or whatever, post-normal age. So in the modern age, the, 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 the metaphor that's, that's quite often used to describe things is a machine type one, you know, with um, levers and cogs and um, things acting on other things that produce an effect that you can see how, how that works. And this leads to this leads to this. There's a, a sort of a, a linear cause and effect kind of thing. If you do A, you'll get, and you, then you do B, you'll get C type of thing. There's that kind of logic in it. Um, Things tend to be simplified and reduced down to their key features and, and they're treated as if they are the full thing. And the goal of the whole thing is to produce equilibrium and st stability and to keep things going the way they always have. If you're a biology teacher, the idea of homeostasis, keeping things, keeping things in steady state, keeping things going more or less as they always have been is a goal. And part of that is certainty knowing what's going to happen and guessing, uh, being able to know what's going to happen next and controlling things. So that's, those are all quite familiar ideas because those are what um, structures how we do things now, especially in a large enterprise like the public education system. But in the postmodern, post-normal com age of complexity, people are saying that instead of the machine metaphor, there's something like a living system or an ecological metaphor in which everything is connected to everything else and tiny effects in one part of the system can produce large effects in other parts. It's not static, it's constantly moving, it's dynamic. And, but the key thing is that there are a large number, a very, very large number of interacting elements. But it's the interactions between the elements that matter, not the elements themselves. That's a key part of this. So in this model, um, uncertainty is assumed that you can't know what will happen if you do X, you won't necessarily get Y. And the other thing about it is that the system is self-organizing. Now that picture there is um, a picture of a flock of starlings. You've probably seen pictures like that, and there's some very good ones on YouTube that um, show them moving. And that's an example of a complex system. It's made up of a very large number of interaction, interacting elements, and um, each starling in the flock um, 
behaves in a certain way that if it turns that way, the other one next to it's got to turn a bit, and this one over here's got to turn a bit that way, and they all react to each other, and that determines the whole much bigger pattern that you see that that photo's being taken of. So there's a whole lot of elements interacting there, but it's the big high-level pattern is what, um, what, what, what matters in this kind of thinking. So that's a quick go at, um, at complexity thinking. So um, these systems are, that, that people are talking about here are all complex. What's a system? It's a group of connected interacting elements that functions as a whole through the interaction of its parts. I think I've already said that. It's the interaction that matters. Interaction, interaction, interaction. That's the spaces between, and you, I hope you can see that, that maps onto this collaboration communities idea that's out there everywhere. Um, so in this system, there's constant interaction and feedback, and some of the feedbacks keep the system going in the same way that it's always been going, but some of them disrupt it. And it's the disruptive ones that we're interested in to seeing what they did and whether that can be, if it's something good, if it can be amplified, or if it's something not so good, it can be damped down. So those of you that uh, uh, you know, um, come from a computer science or mathematics background probably know quite a lot of this stuff. Um, the systems are self-organizing, and the important thing, uh, one important thing is that when change happens, it's often sudden and abrupt. It just pops up, and no one knew it was going to happen, um, but it, it's important to notice when something's happened and to, to notice whether we want to do anything about it or not. So small changes can make a big difference. One size doesn't fit all. There's no single right answer to any problem. And really importantly, the context within which the system is operating is everything. A system operating in a particular way in one place or one environment will work in a completely different way if it's in another one. So you can't have generic one-size-fits-all answers and templates to things. Um, so what systems thinking, or some people say, uh, this is one quote I've seen, that it's seeing the forest and the trees in any situation. Like seeing the big picture and the individual units. Seeing the ecosystem, focusing on the interactions within a system and between one system and another, not looking for chains and cause and effect. So you'll know that a lot of the policy um, uh, structures that you work within and you, that are, you're managed within um, do think in terms of causes and effects and levers and so on. And if you do this and you provide these incentives, that will happen and so on. But as we all know, quite often it doesn't. Although it looked like it, uh, that there would be that sort of relationship, there isn't necessarily. So, nearly there now. Um, that, so in the management and leadership field, there's a huge literature on this now in terms of thinking about you know, what, how to organize, how to know what to do in big companies, particularly ones that had to be very, very responsive to very sudden shifts in the market and so on. So there's a lot of work about this, and there's lots and lots of theories that people have got about what we should do in complexity. And this one is very um, common. People use this a lot. And basically, just very quickly, because this is really complicated, um, these people say, Snowden and Dave Snowden, this guy's name is, who's um, just look him up. There's lots of really good things on the internet about him. Um, he's come up with this thing he calls the Kinefin framework. That's a Welsh word. Um, that that's basically for um, figuring out what kind of system you're in. And he's classified them into four kinds. The simple one is when um, you, you know if you do do X or Y, it, Y will follow. And like night follows day. It always happens. It happens every time. And so you can plan on that basis. So you work out what system it is. You, you decide what it is. And then you respond. So that's what, we, that's what we're familiar with. That's what we know. He puts what, <coughs> what we call best practice into that quadrant. So that's when we, we know if we do this, that will happen. And the complicated um, qu quadrant, it's, it's when um, things are a bit more complicated, the situation, the answer's not necessarily known now, but if you get some experts in and you get them to research the situation and write a report on it and come up with it and argue about it and have a lot of negotiation, eventually they'll probably be able to um, come up with some solution to that problem and then that will move it into the simple framework because we'll know what that is. But he, so that's, um, that's where you need experts. And he says that that's where good practice would fit in there knowing what to do when you don't know what to do. 
Now, if it moves into the complex domain, that's where that's the realm of what he calls the unknown unknowns. We don't know what to do. There are no answers, and if we, even if we got all the experts in the world, we wouldn't be able to figure out what to do because it's not a known system. So. The hard question is, what do you do in that kind of context? And we're going to talk very briefly about one idea for what people do in this context in a minute. But basically, it's a, number of, um, a large number of very small experiments to test how the system's working and then see what happens, see what emerges. And if something that's positive happens, ramp it up. If it's negative, damp it down fast. And then, um, just I won't go into this much, but... What Snowden argues is that it's very, very common, and it's very common in the education system, to assume you're in the simple quadrant and to, and to have policies and so on that um, focus there. And when you're not, as we're not, um, and the things don't work, it very quickly tips, tips over into the chaos um, quadrant in which um, you, you, action's impossible. That, that diagram there is supposed to re the, the line's supposed to represent a cliff because you fall off that suddenly into the, into the, into the chaotic zone. So that's when you, you've got to act anyway, do something, like if there's an earthquake or a disaster or something like that, and try to control the situation, as get under control as fast as possible, and then decide what to do next after that. So that's just one example, but that's, there's, a, there's a, a large literature on this, and it's quite influential in the world beyond education now. If you find this an interesting um, set of ideas and you want to follow up further, um, you can go to his website, which is cognitiveedge.com. There's lots of stuff there. Um, and there's a, a reasonably straightforward article, that one on the Harvard Business Review there. It's not very long. That um, There's a good introduction to it. And the other thing that I'd recommend is this book that um, is written by an co ex-colleague of mine that's just come out, Jennifer Garvey Berger and Keith Johnston. It's written for, it's a leadership kind of book, but it explains some of the stuff with a lot of examples and things that make it quite easy to understand how to think about how to, how to operate in, this, in complexity. It's called Simple Habits for Complex Minds, Powerful pra Practices for Leaders. Um, now, so what's all this got to do with modern learning environments and education's futures, which is what I'm supposed to be talking about? Um, <laughs> I hope you can see, sorry, I just realised I'm standing in the way. Um, so what I want to argue here is that just adding new inputs into a system, like for example, fancy new ideas or really good new structures or really good policies or whatever, just putting new inputs doesn't change it because the system's already got a life of its own and the structures and the systems and the policies and stuff just... It can just be annoying and add extra extra work and extra stuff for people. But if the underlying structures are resilient as they are in the education system, they're really not disposed to change at all. Um, nothing nothing happens. But change does come in systems, according to this theory, when and this is really important when the elements in this in a system interact <laughs> in new ways. So if you just throw a um, hand grenade into a, into a system and expect that, um, well, actually probably that would change things, but you, know, you, lob, you, lob, you lob something into the system, it doesn't necessarily change things. But if the elements in the system, and you are elements in a system, if the elements interact in different ways from the ways they did in the past, according to systems theory, that's what will change things. That's, so that goes back to what I was saying before, is that we need different ways of interacting at the, at the grassroots level, and that's where change will come from, not from fantastic new policies from the Minister of Education or whatever. So new ideas, new ways of structuring old stuff, old information, so if we repackage it, that doesn't make a difference, but new ways of thinking about old stuff do. do. So it's the elements in the system interacting with each other and thinking in new ways about it that's what what's make makes a difference. Um, so as I said before, one size doesn't fit all. Um, future practice is going to emerge. No one knows or can direct or control what it will be. We, no one knows. We can't say we want this and then put a plan in place and that's what will happen. It won't be like that. Um, but what 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 it's important for getting the best possible outcomes from any system that knows what it's trying to do and that has a clear sense of um, what its purpose is, there's three things. Number one is the quality of the elements in the system. That's, that's you guys and the quality of your thinking and interacting with each other. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is the quality of the interactions between the elements. 
So that means when we talk about collaboration, not just getting together and having a quick five minute meeting and pooling ideas, that just reproduces the status quo. It's getting together and spending a long time together and doing something with your, the ideas together that take that much further, that take that idea further, that moves it on. Not just it's not just sharing, it's much more than just sharing. That's really important. So it's the quality of the interactions between the elements that need to be robust and strong and will involve conflict and argument and debate and so on. It's not necessarily all being nice to each other. It's pushing ideas hard and fast, but in the context in which we know where, what vague direction we're trying to go in, what the purpose of it all is. So, um, <coughs> and that, the, the idea is that that builds collective intelligence rather than individual intelligence. So a key thing here that I want to say is that um, we talk all the time uh, and we hear um, in educational publications and so on about the things we need to do for the students, for the children, for the learners in the school system. They need these kinds of things if they're going to survive in the world beyond education and so on, right? But one, a point that I think is really, uh, you know, it's taken me a while to get this, but I think it's really, really important. We can't expect teachers to design these kinds of experiences for students if they haven't actually experienced it themselves and if they don't know what that feels like and how hard it is and how and so on and so I I mean I, I better not start on this topic because I'm supposed to stop now but um, I mean I think that's got major implications for teacher professional learning and I don't think we should even call it that now um, in, the, in the sense of what kinds of things teachers need to be able to become future ready for the future and to be able to do these kinds of things for kids because it's not the same stuff as what we did when we went to school. It's a different world now. Doesn't make a mockery of the idea of the flipped classroom and everything. Well, I think it does. Uh, that, that's that's my... Yeah. But, well, actually, there's some circumstances in which it could be appropriate, but only when we've thought about what, what's in the curriculum and what we're learning and what we're learning it for. But um, if that was just the be-all and end-all of everything... It would be um, a bit, it, all these things would be pointless. All these techniques and um, technologies and so on are pointless if we don't have a sense of what the purpose of education is, what we're trying to do there. It's all just fancy add-ons. The, 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 the debate about what the purpose of it is is really important. So I think that we need much more of a big picture awareness, an awareness of what's going on in the world beyond education and some of these trends and what they really mean. They're not just um, You've heard of this term greenwashing? You know, that we, not, we, we don't just do a whole lot of things that look as if we're green. <laughs> um, you know, that, um, like recycling and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But we, we're actually doing something that would be, um, that, that, that has an effect. And but we, so we know something about the big picture context, but it gets reworked for the local context, for the school, for the class, for the individual, for whatever's going on in the here and now. And really importantly, everyone thinking for themselves, not waiting f to be told by the bureaucracy or the, being told not to do it by the, by the, by the structures. Um, and I'll just finish this part with this slide. Um, this is a quote from a historian writing of just not that long ago who said that historical change is like an avalanche. The starting point is a snow-covered mountainside that looks solid, looks really solid, you could walk on it and jump on it. But all changes are going on below the surface, and I think that's what's happening now. There's a whole lot going on underneath the ground, um, and are invisible at the time, but something's coming, it's just we don't know when. And I think we kind of need to be thinking about when we can be ready for it. And I think that's it, so it's your go now. So, how do you feel about modern learning environments now? Um, so what we thought we'd wrap up the session because these are these are huge ideas. I don't know about you, but I know that for me, the first time I started dealing with some of these things and realizing just how ingrained some of these ideas were, and then every time I spend some time with Jane, um, I feel like my head's turned to scrambled eggs, <laughs> and I start questioning everything I thought I knew, um, which is you know it's quite big and it takes time to actually work through these ideas. So what we've what we're suggesting that we do for the next part is I'd like to introduce you to the idea of a safe to fail probe. So not a fail safe, but a safe to fail. Yeah, so this is linked to the Kinefin framework and this idea of complexity thinking. So a safe to fail probe is something that you do in order to see more of something or less of something. So if you think about your system, so for example, what we're really interested in is how do we develop the ability or the thinking of teachers so that they think about these 
juicy, gritty things that are going on for us right now. There's, I mean, if you may have picked up that a huge part of this complexity stuff um, actually came through in Grant Lippmann's keynote on, um, was it Wednesday morning? Um, that he talked about those, uh, about it being an ecology. So all that stuff has come through this whole conference again and again, but we actually need to be thinking about that if we really want to do something about getting at this whole idea of education futures. So the Safe to Fail probe is a safe space to do that in. So if you think about something that you would like to see more of, so for us we would like to see more teachers actually thinking and examining those paradigms that underpin the things we do every day and we don't even think about why we do them. Um, it's different from a fail-safe in a number of ways. So it is not a safe-to-fail probe when you need buy-in from people, then it doesn't work. You need permission. So if you have to ask someone's permission to do it, it's not a safe-to-fail probe. Um, if you need a communication plan, these sound really familiar to a lot of things that happen in school, don't they? Um, significant money, if you need to consider how you're going to roll it out. Um, if you're planning fail-safe, so if you're planning things already to make sure that it is going to work, then you're doing it wrong. It's quite counterintuitive, that, isn't it? Um, if it's complicated or if there's no way to learn from it. Unusual set of criteria if you think what we're used to doing in schools, right? So what the safe to fail probe then is, now that you know what it's not, is a little bit of an experiment. So an experiment to learn about the system. Because we're saying that things are so complex that we cannot possibly understand it all. And you know, if you're teachers, you know how complex the classroom can be. You don't know about all the stuff that's happened at home, about that child's history, about the other teacher and their issues they're having at home. And, there's so many factors, it's far too complex. And it's the same for the education system and our classrooms. So a safe to fail probe is something that we can do that kind of pokes at the system and then watches what happens. It's essentially what it does. So we would like you to have a go at designing some safe to fail probes as a bit of a poke at the system that you might be in or the second part of that email that I sent you has four scenarios, four different schools. So we all, there's a huge diversity of schools at ULIN. It's one of the things I love about this conference. But I've given you four scenarios. So what I'm going to ask you to do is in your group of three that you're sitting, pick one of these scenarios. And then I'd like you to have a go at trying to decide what you want to see more of in this school and what you want to see less of, given what you have just learnt about things. I'm just going to say things because I don't really know that there's a word that captures all of these enormous ideas. What are the things you want to see more of? What are the things you want to see less of? So like I said, we w personally want to see more teachers thinking for themselves not just using a recipe and implementing in their classroom, not just thinking that there is one answer. We want people thinking for themselves. So if I want to see more of that in this environment, what is something that I could do? I'll give you an example of something that I've been doing recently, so a little safety fail probe that I've been trying. Um, we are currently in the process of reviewing our science program, trying to decide, well, what should we actually teach, given all of the complex stuff we've just talked about. It's not an easy ask. But I've also noticed that our ment the, the norm is for us to kind of revert back to old ways of thinking. So we always go, oh, but they have to pass their NCA exam, so we have to think about that. And we always keep, we keep coming back to this thing. Or we might say things like, oh, but, you know, um, everyone should know about atoms. Well, why should everyone know about atoms? Why? I don't know. So... What I wanted was for us to move away from just accepting the status quo. So my safety fail probe was using I notice. So in those meetings, I said, oh, I notice we keep bringing up NCEA um, as the sole purpose for what we're doing here. And I just left it at that. That's all I did. All I wanted was deeper discussion of why is it that we're doing what we're doing. So I think it's quite important in the 
sense of doing this activity is it's, is it's not a new idea that you're going to roll out to everyone and they're all going to copy and it's going to be fantastic. It's just a tiny thing like that, that by talking in a different way to how she normally would, um, it kind of, it sort of pokes the system a bit and it brings out little different things which might not happen um, if, if she spoke in the normal way she might have spoke to people or with, with other teachers. And it already has, hasn't it? I mean, yeah. it, 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 it's interesting because these tiny things um, do provoke interesting responses from other people. And the important thing to say about this is that these things are to understand the present, to understand what's going on now, what's really going on in all its complexity, not just the um, boxes that it's supposed to fit into, that you've got a ticking compliance, so you've got this, this, and this, but actually a whole lot of other things are going on. And the assumptions that we often make about our system. So, um, like Jane said, I've been doing this and it's been very interesting um, because what has happened is that people actually started thinking that actually this isn't a simple thing that we're dealing with here. This is really complex. We need to think about this in more detail. We should probably get in somebody who knows more about this. So we started calling and emailing some people who've been working and dealing with these ideas longer. Um, another person in our team has stepped up and taken leadership who before was kind of quiet and not really engaging it, but is really stepped up and is really engaging in this conversation and then bringing others in. So tiniest, tiniest thing. Didn't need a communication plan, didn't need any of those things, but already it had a huge, it taught me a huge amount of things about that system. So, any questions? So right. it's, it's a task that we think about that as, as, right. as, as, as a classroom teacher. Could be as a classroom teacher, could be as a head of department, it is up to you. Um, in your group of three, pick one of the scenarios, decide on a safe to fail probe, and Jane and I will move around and be devil's advocates. <laughs> All right. There you go. So what are your thoughts so far? Okay. So do you need permission for that? Vera? Roll out plan? That kind of thing. What's, something, what's that idea look like scaled down? What's a smaller version of that idea? Would that, who's dictating what they learn in that situation? So if you're saying, hey, come in at lunchtime, do what? What do you think? Okay. So that's going to tell you something one way or the other way. All right. What then? So let's say I'm a student and I go. So hypothetically, if I respond and I say, ah, oh, yeah, there is some stuff I want to work on, what then? What does that tell you? Mm. Okay. So, and then if you go deeper with that, if you're thinking about, well, if a student, if they all go, no, what does that tell you about the system? If they all go, no, don't be ridiculous. What does that tell you about the system? Does it tell you they don't want to learn? No. Does it tell you? So, one of the things you can play with is having multiple probes going on so that you can learn more about that system. So, what else is there that you can do that's going to tell you more about that thing that you want to see more of or less of?
probe so far? What have you thought you might do? So just your probe is just the question. There's a really interesting thing that happened. I, as a coach, some why questions. Okay, why, why is it that you do that? Okay. Do you know how many times I was pulled aside and said that I'm questioning authority? So this is in one on one situations that I asked them, so not publicly, but I'm questioning authority because I'm questioning the hierarchy. What does that tell me about the system? We might think, you know, things are really changing, but if I'm being pulled up because I'm questioning authority, and someone who doesn't even have authority over me, what does that tell me? This wasn't even a senior management or a senior leader. Like I said, it was somebody with no authority or whatsoever. So it's the things that we learn about the system that we then, what it does really is it just it makes more questions for you ultimately. But that's the kind of thing we're thinking about. So what can we then do? What else do we then do? What might this reveal? What are we going to see more? What do we want to see more of? When I go talk to these guys, they look like they're not talking. So, any thoughts from you guys so far? So, let's say scenario two, because I think scenario two would be one of those places that if you're a teacher who's really into change and want to try these new things that would be re might be really challenging to work in what might be some of the things that what could be a safe to fail probe that you could try in that environment so that's those um can you go back to the first slide yeah so if you go back to that first slide sorry i shouldn't do that i have a habit of so, up. All right, so, what do you want to see more of? What do you want to see less of? So those things that I said, it doesn't need a communication plan, it doesn't need a rollout. It's just something really simple that you do. Like I said, that I started saying, I know this. So when people are falling back on those old paradigms, I just say, oh, I know this, that we're talking about blah, blah, blah. So it's something really simple that you could do if you were in that really traditional model. What makes you say that? So, all right. Change what the main 
So there are, I guess, the primary, middle, and secondary. It's organized into that. I could find out, well, what about that? I could find out about those parent relationships. Are they really as good as, I think, as, as what the vet said? What are those relationships? Are they parents gossiping in the background? Are they parents involved? Well, they do they say it's strong family orientation oh, right. and stuff. So they're saying it's strong. And what you're saying is it's strong. I could say, is it strong? I could say, what is the nature of that strong family orientation? So a probe isn't designed to, you know, change the entire thing of the school. It's something that tells us more about the system, any system. It could tell you more about your family. So that in itself will be fascinating. So what would they go somewhere else if they had a choice? So and what are the dynamics there in terms of if they don't have a choice, does that what ideas then stay there in that community and never change? So these the, the thing to wrap your head around here is that any single one of us is connected to loads and loads of other people and those people interact with other people and those people interact and you and I have a certain kind of relationship and you and I have a certain kind of relationship and the way we interact that has a spillover effect on something else that we do. So those interactions are really key. So all I'm doing is I'm changing something I do slightly and having a look, does that impact any of the other interactions that I'm having? So in this environment, we see that very traditional New Zealand rural school idea. It's very generic, but yet, in, our, in those schools, what do I want to see more of in those rural schools? Well, what is something that I'd want to see more of in that school? Well, I think we could have anything in that that says it's traditional New Zealand. I think we could have that school and it could be not connected. Yeah. 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 So the idea for us was that you can't assume, we don't want to give too much about the situation. Because it's the probe really that says, what do I want to find out about it? Because if we're finding out about a system, that's what the probe is about. So finding out about the system. Yeah, and that's the big thing. It's, it's not thinking, hey, we're going to roll out this literacy program. We're going to try out this modern learning environment. We're going to go BYOD. It's not about an answer, it's about finding out about the system. What is it like? What's going on? And what do I want to see more of in the system? Is it that I want to see more teachers using devices? Or was it that I wanted to see, if I think about BYOD, or is it that I wanted to see more students and teachers interacting with the world outside of the classroom? Then my probe might have been, hey, here's an iPad for your class. See if you can use it. And then leave it. So instead of telling them, here's the policy, this is how we're rolling it out, step one. So it's a very, very small kind of poke at what is going on. And does that affect the system in a good way or a bad way? If it's a bad way, I stop doing it immediately. The Simple Habits for Complex Times one, 150% recommend reading. Absolutely 100%. It's one of the, that one and the. There's been some really interesting discussions, and I know that the ones that I was part of, our immediate kind of response as a teacher is quite, is on that rollout level, you know? There's the, oh, we're going to try this, or what about this? Oh, we'll implement this thing. Um, there's lots of, you know, those literacy program moments where we've got this new literacy program that happens, but actually we need to scale that right back and just kind of test the water a little bit. So I, I quite like that example I used at the beginning that I noticed because it's so incredibly simple, yet it's made a huge difference. Um, that book that Jane recommended before, The Simple Habits for Complex Times, um, phenomenal book. 
I absolutely highly recommend that you read it. Um, but it goes into this idea in a lot more detail and it's written in really layman's terms of how do you do this and what does this look like in different contexts. So it ha actually has like little stories almost throughout it so you can follow it. What does this actually look like in practice, these ideas? So, um, any thoughts from you guys just before we wrap up? Questions? Comments? The gentleman up on the front had were wondering things before. Any further questions or comments from you? Do I, should I get my microphone ready? Well, I've just discovered I've been um, giving a high school, high school math teacher a hard time and I'm sitting next to a high school math teacher. <laughs> Uh, my question in all of this is where does the government sit in all of this? Because ultimately they are the ones who make the legislation, they are the ones who make the official documents and guidelines that we are accountable to, the NCAs and the that's national standards of this world. That's a relatively, um, oh, I'll say last 10 years or so, uh, recent way of looking at it, but it's still not The government is actually the servant of us. You know, we, vote, we vote them in. It's, it's not like it's a company that has... I mean, I know there are rules and regulations, but the, the education system is there to, to, for the greater good of the greatest number of people in the country, and it's there to serve those needs. But because of a lot of the things that have happened in the last 20 years, teachers are basically too busy to um, be thinking too deeply. But, but, it's got, right. but, I mean, but, I mean, that has to change. People yeah. have to do that and, you know, tick the boxes. Yeah. Because otherwise... I mean, I really think it's a system that's in the throes of dying. It's, it's, it's losing energy, it's winding down, and eventually, I, I think in our lifetime, we'll see the end of the public education system unless it, new energy comes in from outside, you know, and then the system's turned, and it's, it's this interaction from, you know, this, this, the level of the system, which is you guys, changes things. That's why I'm interested in this stuff, because I think it's in the throes of dying, and, and that's what, what we still have to, we can't wait for the end of it. And in saying that, that's also why if you're not on Twitter yet, if you're not part of all these many things, I know I talk about Twitter all the time, but the thing why I am so, why I so passionately advocate for it, the government can't serve you if they don't hear your voice. Yeah. If you just go to the polling booth and that's all you've got, how are they going to hear what's going on? Yeah. There's a huge amount of politicians that are online that will actually talk to you and respond to you. They weirdly I tweeted one and then she said oh why don't you get in touch so I got in touch and she called me 10 minutes later to talk about it they are quite responsive. so they don't hear you unless you actually speak to them so whether Twitter is your medium whatever else your medium is you have to get so outside of your classroom and talk to them if you want them to hear what's going on and if it's not just one voice but it's a collective voice it has a very different effect um, any other questions I'm at high school level, I'm at Hobsonville Point Secondary, um, which I don't know if you know anything about it. Yeah, yeah we're kind of the school that went and went, ah, oh, we're just doing everything differently. Um, and, but we're a completely public school. Um, same curriculum you guys use, we just went and made it work for what we wanted to do a bit better. But if you're interested in Hobsonville Point, we suffer a serious case of oversharing and you can find just about everything, including the, in two years we've had like four or five timetables now. You can find all of those variations and why we changed online as well. So everything about us is public. So that wasn't actually my question, but because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sort of in the same situation. So I teach mm. year 10. <laughs> There's been some really interesting discussions and I know that the ones that I was part of, our immediate kind of response as a teacher is quite, is on that rollout level, you know? There's the, oh, we're gonna try this or what about this? Oh, we'll implement this thing. Um, there's lots of, you know, those literacy program moments where we've got this new literacy program that happens, but actually we need to scale that right back and just kind of test the water a little bit. So I, I quite like that example I used at the beginning that I noticed because it's so incredibly simple, yet it's made a huge difference. Um, that book that Jane recommended before, The Simple Habits for Complex Times, um, phenomenal book. 
I absolutely highly recommend that you read it. Um, but it goes into this idea in a lot more detail, and it's written in really layman's terms of how do you do this and what does this look like in different contexts. So it ha actually has like little stories almost throughout it so you can follow it. What does this actually look like in practice, these ideas? So um, any thoughts from you guys just before we wrap up? Questions? Comments? The gentleman up on the front who had wondering things before, any further questions or comments from you? So should I get my microphone ready? teaches a hard time and I'm sitting next to a high school math teacher. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm fine. Uh, my, my question, I guess, is where the government... Uh, my question in all of this is where does the government sit in all of this? Because ultimately they are the ones who make the legislation, they are the ones who make the official documents and guidelines that we are accountable to, the NCAs and the national, national standards of this world. And in saying that, that's also why if you're not on Twitter yet, if you're not part of all these many things, I know I talk about Twitter all the time, but the thing why I am so, why I so passionately advocate for it, the government can't serve you if they don't hear your voice. Yeah. If you just go to the polling booth and that's all you've got, how are they going to hear what's going on? There's a huge amount of politicians that are online that will actually talk to you and respond to you. They, weirdly, I tweeted one and then she said, oh, why don't you get in touch? So I got in touch and she called me 10 minutes later to talk about it. They are quite responsive. So they don't hear you unless you actually speak to them. So whether Twitter is your medium, whatever else your medium is, you have to get so outside of your classroom and talk to them if you want them to hear what's going on. And if it's not just one voice, but it's a collective voice, it has a very different effect. Um, any other questions? Yep. What level do you teach? I'm at high school level. I'm at Hobsonville Point Secondary, um, which I don't know if you know anything about it. Yeah. Yeah, we're kind of the school that went and went, ah, oh, we're just doing everything differently. Um, and, but we're a completely public school. Um, same curriculum you guys use, we just went and made it work for what we wanted to do a bit better. But if you're interested in Hops of One Point, we suffer a serious case of oversharing and you can find just about everything, including the, in two years we've had like four or five timetables now, you can find all of those variations and why we changed online as well. So everything about us is public. So that wasn't actually my question, but because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, th I'm sort of in the same situation. So I teach mm. year 10. But and when you said before that when you're meeting up with the staff and it always comes back to NCEA, so we're trying to be very progressive with all our ideas, but then, uh, and I'm not really bound by any sort of assessments as such in year 10, so we've got that mm. freedom. What do you say to the teachers of the NCEA subjects? That's what I mean, what year group we, are you involved so with? So at the moment, we've got nines and tens and about a handful of year 11s. Okay. Um, and at the moment, we're dealing with that full-on, mm. head-on, brain-melty type stuff. Yeah. Um, so for us, because we're such a small staff, we're all dealing with it, and we're dealing with it together. 
Um, but what it will mostly likely look like for us is that students will choose what standards they're interested in and want to do and not the teachers. So I won't go, hey, it's maths, these are the standards we're doing this year. You can choose to drop out of some of them if you can't cope. But, 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 but listen to that, what you're saying is that they're doing it together. They're doing it as a staff. They're collectively taking responsibility. They're not risk averse. Mm -hmm. they, no. They're finding a way around this. They are doing it, but they're doing it a different way. And that together is really important, I think. And I can tell you it is incredibly challenging. Like, I, I don't think I actually got what collaboration meant until I got to the school. Um, there's a lot of cooperation going on, you know, you delegate, you do this, but I'll do this, but I'll do this bit together, and oh yep, we're agreeing, and we're being all very collegial, but I don't think it was until I got to Hobsonville Point where I really, where it's those huge paradigms that just clash and come tumbling down, and you question every moment of what you do, is it good enough? You know, it's, it's non-stop, and even now, um, there's people think, oh, you know, Hobsonville Point, they, they've got it sorted, but really, we're just one huge experiment after experiment after experiment as we're dealing with this together and talking about it and using everybody's different strengths. So we've got a hugely diverse team in terms of expertise and we're using those strengths. It doesn't work if it's just one person or one recipe and it's flexible. It's, yeah, it's a very cool place to work. Yeah, I do. So we are running out of time. So um, if like me... You're a bit of a nerd, I hope you are, and you've gotten the message about think for yourself a bit better. Please, those are the two books that um, Jane mentioned. I recommend them both a hundred times over. Um, but also, uh, one of the um, other projects, the other projects that we're working on, so Edgework is associated with AUT. It's the organisation that Jane runs, the network, um, and specifically they work in this area of how we can get more of this stuff happening. And then the other final thing that I'm very excited about. Um, my master's project that I'm working with on Jane, the two of us together, is developing a MOOC. So that's a massive open online course. You may be familiar with those. We're developing one together that is go well, we'll be making these ideas, more of them, because believe it or not, there's a whole lot more of them, and making them more accessible. Getting you a chance to really sink your teeth into them is completely free. It's completely free. Um, Creative Commons, open access, using some of this like choice and personalized learning, all those buzzwords I'm trying to throw in there as well for good measure, just to kind of, as if it's not a big enough job, you know, throw that into. So the idea behind this is that we cannot see the shift we want, we can't get our government on board if we are not actually, if we don't have some grit and juice behind our arguments, if we don't really actually understand and think for ourselves properly. So the idea behind this MOOC is to give you guys access to that and bring your whole staff on board, bring your department, and because it's open, because it's free, you can do it together and it's not a big expensive conference that you have to go to. Um, you can do it from any part of the country. Yep, it's free. Online, between uh, February and February. Yeah, so that should be launching end of February. Um, if you're interested in that, the eChat NZ site um, has a sign up list if for more information so you can stay in the loop around that. Um, but I think final comments really, I think. Um, anything from you? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.